All right, let's talk about chapter four. And this one, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of biology. So without uh, knowing the basics of how biology came about, um, we can't talk about marine biology. All right, so the first question I want to ask you guys is what is life? Because as humans, we're considered alive. But what does that actually mean to you? Some people would say, are we just animated or automated goo, right? But what is it? So take a moment, answer that for yourselves, um, and come up with whatever answer that you may, um, you may think of as when you hear the word life. All right, so what is life? Uh, your textbook defines it as uh, a process that is not random, right? Uh, our genes and our cells are not just randomly haphazardly put together. Um, there's actually a structure to it. And there's all, the structure is chemically and physically organized. So our cells are chemically organized. Um, there's chemical processes that have to happen in order uh, for things to work as well as physically, right? Our muscles have to work in coordination with our brain and whatnot. And if none of that um, worked together, then we wouldn't be able to function as we do today. So uh, the other point is that the energy, we need energy in order to fuel ourselves um, and it needs to, we need to be able to remain um, in what's known as homeostasis with our surroundings. So we need to be able to uh, live in a surrounding where we don't need extra, say, equipment or we don't need anything aside of what we need, what we have in order to live um, in our surroundings. So for example, uh, we live on land. Humans live on land, and uh, it doesn't take anything but energy for us to live on land, right? We breathe the oxygen, and uh, we exhale carbon dioxide, and we eat food in order to keep us going. Uh, but aside from that, uh, there's no real other requirements for us to live on land. Whereas if we tried to live in the ocean or in space, we would need some sort of apparatus like a spacesuit or a scuba suit um, in order for us to live in those two environments. So in that sense, we would not be in homeostasis with our surroundings. Uh, we, would, we would have to find some sort of external way of living there. So in that sense, that's that's what that point means. And then also, we need to have some sort of way of passing on our genes. So nucleic acids are uh, ways, are uh, cells, or not cells, they are genetic code that helps us pass on our genes to our future generation. And they have to be successful. If they're not successful, then we would, uh, as a species, we would not... Uh, we would not procreate and, and continue on um, in generations. So that's what your textbook says life is. So um, everybody has their own definition depending on what you came up with. And there is no wrong definition in this case. It's just scientifically speaking, this is what uh, science has said life is. So uh, the ingredients for life, uh, as you can see as this, uh, this cartoon depicts, it is a primordial soup. And back when um, things were coming together and there still wasn't any life on Earth, all you had were molecules and water. And scientists theorize that because of those molecules within the water, that's how life was able to get its start. Without water and without molecules, there would be no life. And so when we go and explore um, other planets in space, those are the two main things that we look for is does that planet have water? Because if it has water, then maybe there might have been a chance that life could have gotten started. All right. So let's look at the main building blocks of life. Uh, we have uh, three organic compounds, carbon, hydrogen, 
and oxygen. And all anything that is classified as organic will have these three uh, elements present within the molecules themselves. So all of you guys sitting there, uh, you're all made up of a different arrangement of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Your computer is also made up of uh, different arrangements of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, everything in life, um, oh wait, that doesn't make sense. Your computer is not an organic compound, so it would not be. Uh, but if there was an organic component to it, then it would be. But that would be kind of uh, interesting because then we would be kind of in like a Star trek -y, you know, cyborg sort of thing. Um, yeah, let's not go there. Anyways, and the four main groups of organic compounds would be uh, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So let's talk about each one separately here. All right, so the first one that we'll talk about are carbohydrates. And for those of you guys who uh, diet, you guys are all familiar with uh, how carbohydrates are a big no-no, right? Uh, when it comes to diets anyways. Um, but the reason why that is, is because you have two different types of carbohydrates. You have simple carbohydrates and you have complex carbohydrates. Now, simple carbohydrates are like, um, well, for example, glucose and fructose. But um, essentially, this would be your, uh, like, vegetables. Your vegetables are simple carbs. Um, they are easy to digest and they don't uh, contribute a lot of uh, fat to your body, which is why in diets they say, oh, you should uh, you should eat more simple carbs instead of complex carbs. Now, when we look at the image on the right hand side there on top, uh, the two the two uh, molecules on the very top, uh, those are your simple carbs. So that that first one would be glucose, the second one would be fructose, and they are. Uh, Single uh, carbon rings, so um, they are easier to digest in your body versus the uh, image on the bottom where you have the two linked together by an oxygen. That would be known as a complex carb. Um, that one is sucrose. And uh, this one is much harder for your body to break down. And it is made up of two or more simple carbs. All right. So generally speaking, all of your starches, uh, like your breads, your processed uh, um, bread, uh, processed, uh, I don't know, my brain is blanking right now. But anyways, uh, processed breads, pastas, your rices, potatoes, all of that are complex carbs. Some carbohydrates that are used in biology is chitin. So chitin is the outer covering for, for a lot of organisms such as insects and crabs. Uh, chitin is also found in squid and octopus. Um, and then cellulose is also a form of carbohydrates which is found in plants. So that sh those structural fibers that hold together the uh, the leaves, that is what's, um, that's what cellulose does. Next we have proteins. So proteins are made out of amino acids and on the right hand side there you can see uh, the uh, general structure of an amino acid. So on the left hand side in blue you have the amino group which is comprised of a nitrogen element and some number of hydrogens. Uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, where they will connect with each other, different amino acids. And then you have that central carbon atom that's generally connected to a carboxyl group. Um, and this is just another carbon group, carbon-based group with uh, an oxygen, a single oxygen and a hydroxyl group, the OH. Um, this OH will readily react with other amino acids and so that's also another connection point and the side chain uh, is where uh, the four different amino acids will have its identifier uh, molecule at that point um, so that one changes but overall that's the general structure of an amino acid 
uh, the different types of proteins that you can um, that you can see are enzymes, hormones, and uh, you'll have structural proteins like hair, bones, and muscles. So the ones that we are very familiar with that we eat on a regular basis are the structural ones like your bone or well some people do eat bone uh, but mainly muscles right but you can also get proteins from uh, nuts and seeds uh, but your other proteins are enzymes enzymes are used to uh, speed up uh, a, a chemical reaction and hormones well we're all familiar with hormones right <laughs> All right, and the next one is lipids. Lipids are your energy source that um, cells will use, and uh, it's generally stored as fat within our human bodies. Uh, that helps provide buoyancy for a lot of uh, marine organisms, like marine mammals, and it also provides warmth. Uh, some examples are fats, oils, and waxes. Uh, some um, whales will produce waxes. And that's what they uh, would use back in the day for uh, candles. So candle wax, that's where they used to get it from, were whales. And then um, uh, lipids are essentially long chains of uh, carbon and hydrogen. And uh, because of these really long chains that it makes, it uh, is really good at repelling water. So a lot of marine organisms will use it on their skin and feathers to um, protect them from getting waterlogged, especially for birds. And lastly, we have nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are the um, DNA and RNA that uh, make up our genes. And so they store and transmit it, trans transmit genetic information um, to future generations. And you, as you can see on the DNA over there, you have four different uh, types of nucleotides. So you have ad adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those are the four main ones in DNA. RNA is very similar, except it is single-stranded, unlike the double-stranded DNA. And uh, thymine is uh, replaced with um, uracine. All right, so those are nucleic acids. So all organic life will have these four uh, main um, organic compounds, nucleic acids, lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. Okay, so what's the fuel of life? Now, um, everything runs on energy, as I mentioned before. Uh, that energy source, uh, everything that we eat, from our food um, and our cells, uh, they need ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So this is the fuel source that uh, cells use. So when we eat that piece of bread, it turns into ATP. The body will turn our food that we eat into ATP. And when the cells get ATP and need to use uh, the energy from it, um, it will uh, take off a phosphate. So on that diagram you see down there, there's three phosphate uh, purple circles that have P's in them. They represent the phosphate groups. And there's three of them, hence the reason why it's called adenosine triphosphate. Um, and when a cell needs that energy, it will break the bond in between the last uh, phosphate and the second one and when it does that that when it releases that bond um, because it is a triple bond uh, it releases a ton of energy and that cell will then in turn use that energy to fuel whatever process it's doing now if the cell still needs a little bit more energy for whatever process it's doing it will break that second tribe um, triple bond between uh, the last two phosphates and uh, will release a little bit more energy. But uh, keep in mind the amount of energy um, that it releases has gone down uh, compared to that first time it broke the bond. And 
Uh, if it needs a little bit more energy, then it will break the bond between the ribose and the third phosphate group. But uh, it the cell essentially uses up more energy than it gets from breaking that third bond. So generally speaking, that cell will not take off all three phosphates unless it's in a dire situation where it needs a lot of energy. But generally speaking, uh, it will only break that first bond between two phosphates and it will um, cause that molecule to become adenosine diphosphate, uh, which means it only has two phosphate groups. Uh, and then it will send that ADP off to essentially recollect its third phosphate and become ATP again. It, in that sense, um, it is more energy efficient to do it that way than to break off all three phosphates. All right, so how does, what, like, what does the cell use this energy for? So one of the processes is photosynthesis, especially if it's a, a plant um, and, or a plankton in the ocean. And this process requires carbon dioxide and water, and it needs uh, ATP in order to power this reaction. So on the right-hand side there, you can see the leaf, and when you zoom in to the, um, to the uh, cells in the leaf, you can see the green balls within those cells. That's the chlorophyll within the leaf. And in the chlorophyll there is where you uh, perform uh, photosynthesis. So on the bottom there, you can see uh, the photosynthesis uh, reaction, um, chemical reaction. And you can see you have six carbon dioxide and six water molecules that are required in addition to ATP and um, solar radiation. And when you have all of that, you get uh, glucose and oxygen. Oxygen is a byproduct. Glucose is uh, uh, the molecule that you're, you're aiming to get. And that glucose is what the plants use as energy. So once glucose is formed, then uh, the cells will further break it down and create uh, ATP from there, even though ATP is required uh, in this reaction here. And as you can see, uh, just respiration goes in the reverse order. So you need uh, glucose and oxygen. And um, you also need, uh, well, you produce uh, ATP from respiration and you uh, release carbon dioxide and water. All right, so autotrophs are basically just organisms that can produce their own energy through photosynthesis. They do not need to consume any food uh, like we do as humans. Um, and typically speaking, you'll see autotrophs mainly as algae or bacteria in the ocean. Uh, on land, uh, plants would also be autotrophs. Uh, but these uh, organisms are responsible for all of the primary production on Earth. So uh, because they uh, perform photosynthesis, they are... Um, one of the main contributors to oxygen within the ocean. So in the bottom there, you can see uh, different algaes, uh, al algae. Uh, you can see cyanobacteria, diatoms, dinoflagellates, uh, basic green algae, coccolithophores, and the image on the right there is an image of a giant kelp. And so giant kelp, or macroalgae, uh, algae, I should say, um, they all photosynthesize and produce oxygen in the ocean. Heterotrophs uh, do not create their own energy source. They have to eat other organisms in order to get their energy that they need. Uh, and an example of that would be uh, your sharks, your fishes, dolphins, uh, any marine mammals, birds, anything that is not plankton or bacteria uh, are heterotrophs. Although bacteria uh, and and plankton uh, can either be autotrophs or heterotrophs. It just depends on what species it is. Some bacteria are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. Um, 
And likewise, um, you have uh, protozoans, which are uh, heterotrophs, and then you also have some plankton like uh, dinoflagellates that are uh, uh, microscopic algae. All right, so respiration. So you have uh, autotrophs who do photosynthesis, but your heterotrophs, because they can't do photosynthesis, the only reaction that they can know how to do uh, is respiration. And we also do this as well, too. I hope. I hope all of you are breathing right now as you're watching this. Otherwise, uh, uh, I'd be a little concerned for you guys. Um, but anyways, so it's the reverse reaction where you uh, need glucose or sugar and oxygen. So we're breathing in oxygen right now, and uh, it creates... Uh, ATP. So this is this is how we uh, restore our ATP uh, energy sources for ourselves, and we release water and carbon dioxide. So when you inhale, you are taking in oxygen, and when you exhale, you are releasing carbon dioxide and water vapor. All right. So. That's just uh, a normal thing. Uh, do keep in mind, though, that autotrophs who do the photosynthesis reaction during the daytime, at nighttime, since there is no sun in order to power this reaction, uh, they are uh, they just do respiration. So all of the trees out there, um, they all respire at nighttime. Everything on Earth, even the plants, need to respire. So uh, fun fact if you didn't know that. All right, and nutrients. So plants, a lot of autotrophs need nutrients. Uh, we as humans also need nutrients. Uh, generally, we would call them minerals or vitamins, but um, it's the same thing. Basically, we're getting um, additional nutrients that we need for our body to uh, allow ourselves to properly function. And so uh, nitrogen is... Uh, one of them, phosphorus, is another, and to a smaller extent, iron. And uh, these are the three main nutrients in the ocean that uh, autotrophs uh, are required to have in order to um, really function properly. And so nitrogen is used to make proteins and nucleic acids, and phosphorus is for ATP as well as your nucleic acids. And... Um, diatoms, radiolarians, and dinoflagellates, they also need uh, silica in addition to um, all the uh, nitrogen uh, and phosphorus and iron. Um, coccolithophores, uh, they require uh, calcium carbonate as well. Okay. All right, so here's just a basic structure of a cell. Um, this is a prokaryotic cell, which we will talk about in a second. And um, a basic prokaryotic cell, or just basic cells in general, you need a nucleus that contains um, the genetic material. You need rhiz rhizome, ribosomes, and you need cytoplasm, plasma, some sort of membrane. So here you would have a, a plasma membrane, and typically you'll have a cell wall. So the cell wall will, and the plasma membrane will protect the genetic material in the nucleoid or the nucleus. Cytoplasm will be the basically uh, goo that protects the genetic material. And rhizo ribosomes are uh, used to create any proteins um, that is needed in the cell. So here uh, we have prokaryo pro prokaryotic cells which I mentioned, and this is uh, the basic structure. Um, most, almost all pro prokaryotic cells that I know of have some sort of flagella, and that helps them move around. Um, and uh, they all have cell walls or some sort of capsule wall that protects the cell from um, any outside, uh, from their surroundings. Um, they have a plasma membrane, and this particular one allows um, oxygen and nutrients to uh, make its way through the membrane into the cell. Cytoplasm is the cushion, and then you have your nucleoid, ribosomes, plasmid, and your pili. Pili are little hairs on the outside that can act as, um, uh, how do you say, 
locomotion, uh, but uh, sometimes they're used for protection. Prokaryotic cells were believed to be the first cells um, or the first life um, that we have on our planet. And typically you can find prokaryote, prokaryotic cells in bacteria uh, in the domains bacteria and archaea. Um, and they are microscopic, so you can't see them with uh, your naked eye. Next category that we have are, are eukaryotic cells. So there's only two, di two different types of uh, cells within the body. Uh, you have prokaryotic, or not in the body, I should say, in the ocean. You have prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. And eukaryotes um, are more complex, and they um, have what's known as membrane-bound organelles. So unlike the previous example in the last slide, uh, the uh, organelles that you have within the cell have membranes around them. So the nucleus has a membrane around it. Uh, it is protected, as well as uh, my mitochondria, which also have membranes. Your Golgi apparatus has a membrane around it. Um, everything in there has its own separate membrane. So anything like oxygen or nutrients that go into the cell need to get past um, multiple layers of membranes in order to get where it's needed to go. Um, oh, in this example uh, right here, you can see that the nucleus is surrounded by another membrane and it has holes in it. And so those holes uh, allow uh, the exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and uh, any nutrients that it needs to get to the nucleus. Interesting fact though, uh, the mitochondria, the blue uh, globs within the cell here, uh, do they look like anything that we've seen maybe say on the last slide there? Um, so scientists theorized that mitochondria actually were free, free living prokaryotic cells at one point in time. And because uh, prokaryotic cells can be heterotrophic or autotrophic, um, they theorized that a heterotrophic prokaryotic cell decided to one day say, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to go eat this guy that's sitting right next to me. So he went and devoured this guy. And normally, normal, normal processes would dictate that the one that got eaten would, would get dissolved and incorporated into the, the larger one. But in this case here, something happened and uh, the one that got eaten didn't get dissolved right away and instead uh, became incorporated into the larger organism. And then uh, uh, they created some sort of mutualistic relationship and became part of this uh, larger cell. And that's where you uh, first start to see eukaryotic cells. So just a fun fact. All right, now, so in terms of levels of organization, so we talked basically about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And when we look at the organization between the two, you can tell that uh, prokaryotic cells uh, are simple compared to eukaryotes. And so you would put the prokaryotes first and then followed by the eukaryotes. Um, but when we get into larger organisms, uh, uh, we have uh, a different sort of classification. Uh, we would talk about unicellular and multicellular instead. So uh, even though the eukaryotic cell uh, incorporated that prokaryotic cell, it would still be considered a single cell organism or a unis unicellular organism because it only has one. It only has one part to it. Uh, one body, right? Whereas uh, us as humans, uh, we are considered multicellular because when you look at what we're comprised of, we are comprised of multiple uh, cells, multiple eukaryotic cells that work together uh, to towards some same goal, right? 
uh, I guess our goal is to live, right? <laughs> so all of our cells make sure that we are still alive and living. Um, and all of these creatures right here, all of our uh, lions and pandas and sharks and seahorses, everything that is essentially macroscopic would be considered multicellular. Uh, generally, when you get down to uh, microscopic organisms, they tend to be unicellular, but that's uh, there's always exceptions to that. So when we look at uh, levels of organization, uh, everything starts off with the atom, right? So there's nothing simpler than an atom or an element. Uh, they're both the same thing. Uh, that atom cannot be broken down any further into simpler components. That is the most simple component that you can get. Um, and then next you have molecules or compounds, um, but those are made up of multiple atoms. And then you get an organelle. An organelle is made up of uh, multiple molecules. And then uh, when you put multiple organelles together, you get a cell, right? So in that eukaryotic um, cell there, if uh, you have multiple, you have like a nucleus, you have uh, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, all of these are organelles. So when you put them all together, you get a, a functioning cell. And then once you put together cells that all function together towards a main goal, that's when you would get a tissue, right? So our tissues, our, our, our muscles all work together, right? They're all um, the same cells that are working together in unison. And then when you put a bunch of tissues together, that's when you get an organ. So our heart is made up of uh, multiple tissues, and so it all functions to pump blood and oxygen throughout our body. And then once you put together multiple organs, that's when you get an organ system. And then once you get an organ system, generally speaking, you'll have an organism. Right, so you have your heart, your lungs, your stomach, your uh, intestines. All of those have to function together to create us as human beings. And then once you have an organism, then when you put multiple organisms together, then you get a population. So you have uh, a group of, say, people, right? All, all similar. All, all that can. All of them can mate with each other. That's when you get a population. And then when you get multiple populations together, that's when you get a community, right? So you have uh, way more people. So a community would be, say, a population, let's just say, would be uh, our class right here. So everybody within this class is a population. A community would be everybody on... Um, the HCC campus, right? Honolulu Community College. Everybody within all the classes at HCC, they would be our community. And then you have an ecosystem. An ecosystem is in when you have multiple communities of different organisms. So let's just continue with our school analogy here. And our ecosystem would be, say, the island of Oahu, where we have different communities interacting with each other. Right? Or either the island of Oahu or you could say uh, the UH uh, system, right? So we have different community colleges and each community college has their own community and and their own population of classes, right? So hopefully that makes uh, some sense for you guys. Um, we have in the ocean in particular, we have three different types of organisms. And this is... Uh, mainly in terms of how they get around in the ocean. Generally speaking, you'll have uh, plan planktonic uh, types of movement, and so that's your plankton, as the, the name would suggest. And these particular uh, organisms just drift in the water. They have very little ability to move around on their own. If they uh, have a flagella, they could uh, move very short distances, but nothing um, that is sustained as our shark over there. Our shark is what's known as a nectin, and they are able to uh, swim wherever they want to, whenever they want to. Uh, 
they are very strong swimmers. And then you have benthic. Benthic means anything that's uh, living on the ocean floor and they typically cannot move. Uh, if they can move, then um, they're not swimming in, in the water column or they're not drifting. They're just staying on the bottom of the, uh, the ocean there. Uh, so how do organisms survive in the ocean? Uh, they need uh, to be aware of what's going on chemically around them because uh, they're living in a water environment. So unlike humans here on, on, on land, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, any chemicals that become airborne and then diffuse, diffusing into our skin and contaminating us. Uh, but in the ocean, uh, you do have to be careful of that because of osmosis uh, and diffusion. Um, and this is essentially when you have um, molecules that go from high concentration to low concentration. That would be diffusion. So um, that would be in the sense of uh, like sugar and whatnot, diffusing through the membranes, getting into your cells or osmosis, and that's the movement of water between a barrier. So whenever we go to the pool or the beach and we stay in the water just a little bit too long, and you, when you come out, you see that your fingertips have um, pruned or become wrinkly. Well, that's because of osmosis. And what's going on in that particular case is that you are losing water to the, the surrounding ocean. So when you come when you come out, your hands being all pruny, your fingertips have your hands have actually lost water to the ocean. So how does that work? Um, well, let's talk about diffusion first. Diffusion allows the cell to bring in any uh, nutrients or um, oxygen that it needs for the cells to uh, properly function. And as you can see in that image there. It's essentially like dropping this blue ink into the uh, the beaker of water here, or the flask of water. And, and that dye is just going to uh, permeate and spread out uh, throughout the water there. So that's what happens within a cell. Um, but in osmosis, uh, this is where water is transported in and out of the cell. And so this particular... Uh, process requires ATP and you have three different states depending on um, what what concentration of the um, minerals are uh, inside and outside of the uh, cell. And so in a normal uh, isotonic solution you'll have an equal number of molecules on the outside as well as the inside of the cell. So there's an equal movement of water in and out of the cell. So you have uh, no gaining of water within the cell and you're not losing too much water to the surroundings. Whereas if you have a hypertonic solution, this is where the surrounding uh, environment has more molecules than the cell itself. And so in this case, uh, the water that's in the cell goes out too quickly um, and your cell loses water. So that's the reason why it shrinks and, and looks wrinkly. So that's the reason why your hands become pruny when you come out of the water. And then um, in a hypotonic solution, uh, this is quite the opposite. This is where your cells will expand because it's taking in too much water. So uh, in this case, you have more a higher concentration of molecules inside of the cell versus the surroundings. So your cell starts to take in water. And in both of these situations, the hypotonic and the hypertonic, um, you're just trying to reach an equilibrium, a balance between uh, the molecules inside versus the molecules outside. And so to do that, your cells either takes in or releases water to do that. 
So in uh, marine organisms such as fishes, they have adapted uh, different ways of handling osmosis. And so let's look at two different examples. We, and this is uh, this image is straight out of your textbook. So uh, in marine fish on the left hand side, the yellow fish, uh, there's going to be more salt out in, in the surrounding ocean than in the fish's body. So in order to uh, accommodate for that, because his body will then start to lose water uh, from, to the surrounding um, ocean, because it's trying to dilute the surrounding ocean using the, the water that's found within the fish. Now, so to in order to prevent losing too much water, the fish has to drink in seawater. So yes, it's drinking in more salt, but that salt is excreted through his gills. And in order to make sure that he doesn't lose too much water, marine fish typically will not uh, urinate, will not pee as much as, um, say, us humans do. But uh, in contrast, the uh, freshwater fish uh, has the opposite problem. The amount of salt in the surrounding water is less than the salt that's within the fish's body. So he that fish will take in water and will start to the cells will start to expand. And so freshwater fishes, the green one on the right hand side, uh, will not drink water like its marine counterparts. Uh, and any salt that is required will be absorbed, not released, through the gills in this case. And in order to get rid of all of the excess water that the cells are accumulating, this the freshwater fish will pee a lot more. Uh, so they urinate uh, a lot. Okay. So how have organisms uh, found ways of adapting to the marine environment uh, because it is it is a, a different environment that you, you know they need to take it into account so uh, salinity is one thing so uh, you have two main types of organisms you have osmoconformers and osmoregulators osmoconformers uh, will change the salinity according to what the environment um, is going on. So if the environment is really salty, then they will um, switch their processes to uh, adjust the salinity within their body versus osmoregulators who control the amount of salinity within their body. So those fishes are osmo osmoconformers, because whatever the environment's doing, that's how they change their salinity. Uh, osmoregulators are uh, a little bit different. They uh, ensure, ensure that they have the right amount of salinity within their body. So marine fishes do this by excreting any excess salt and water, uh, depending on uh, what environment they're in. Next is temperature. Uh, so marine organisms have four different methods. Um, and in this particular case, you can have uh, two different types of methods for controlling your temperature. So the first one are, is ectotherms. Ecto, ectotherms uh, use enzymes to, uh, uh, how do you say, control their body temperature in colder temperatures. So these are your cold-blooded organisms. So typically reptiles um, will be cold-blooded, will be ectotherms. Um, and so their, their body works better uh, in colder temperatures because enzymes uh, work better that way. Uh, endotherms are your warm-blooded organisms. So uh, their enzymes work better in warmer temperatures. And... Uh, next, you have poikilotherms. It's quite a mouthful there. Um, but poikilotherms can adjust their body temperature to the environment. So, for instance, uh, we uh, no, we are uh, cold-blooded organisms. So your snake there. Uh, snakes are 
ectotherms and they are poikilotherms because uh, they can adjust their body temperature. Uh, so, for instance, that snake who sun sunbathes, he's uh, warming himself up because the sun's out. Um, and then if nightfall night time comes and he uh, he uses that warmth that he got to keep himself warm through the night. Um, but once that warmth wears off, then his enzymes will allow him to uh, stay at a, a balanced temp temperature. Uh, and then you have homeotherms, which regulate their body temperature. And, and this is not dependent on uh, the environment. And so us as humans, we are homeotherms and we are endotherms because we are warm-blooded and we can regulate our body temperature. So if we uh, wanted to uh, get warm because we're a little bit cold, we can uh, put a jacket on and, and be fine with that. Or we can add more fat, right? And that's what marine organisms do. They add more fat onto themselves to keep themselves warm. Um, some ways, other, other ways to adapt to the marine environment are uh, surface to volume ratio. So depending on what this S to V ratio is, um, you can uh, avoid sinking and uh, you can avoid uh, losing too much water and, and nutrients to the surrounding ocean. So in this case over here, let's just compare these different blocks here. The smaller block has a larger S to B ratio, a six to one. And in this case there, he, um, because he uh, has a larger ratio, he re is reducing his sinking rate and he's reducing the amount of water and nutrient loss to the surrounding ocean versus the, uh, the three, three meter by three meter by three meter uh, cube. Uh, that one has a two, two to one ratio. And in this case, um, this cube will tend to sink quicker because it's not only heavier, um, but its surface area to volume is much smaller. All right. And then some other ways um, that life uh, exists is through reproduction. So you need to have some way of transferring your genetic information to uh, future generations. And in or order to do that, um, uh, you need to have genes, right? You need to have to, a method of reproduction. So that transfer of genetic information is known as, as hereditary, right? So when we talk about, oh, it's hereditary to uh, be double jointed or to have a widow's peak, well, that's, that's because it's uh, transferring those genes from um, mother or father to offspring, right? Um, and so reproduction varies depending on uh, whether you are prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So in prokaryotic uh, reproduction, typically this is uh, done by cell fission, right? So this is essentially where uh, the cells just uh, replicate themselves and split into two identical uh, new cells. And so in this case, you're basically making a clone of yourself. So just think, uh, you know, if you were a prokaryote and uh, you were just sitting here listening to my lecture and you decided to, uh, that it was time to uh, divide and create a new, a new, per a new clone of yourself, uh, you would just sit here, copy all, everything that's within yourself and then you would start to split apart. And then eventually, by the end of this lecture, you will have two of yourselves that are identical. Just think, you would have an identical twin. Uh, and so, yeah, that's pretty much how prokaryotes uh, reproduce. Uh, they do have a um, sexual reproduction, but Typically speaking, it's all asexual reproduction. So in this case, you don't need a partner. So that's why I say you could just sit here and create a clone of yourself if you wanted to. Um, but in the ocean, typically you'll see fission, which is common in bacteria. You'll see budding, which you see that uh, sea anemone right below 
uh, doing, or you can uh, have vegetative reproduction, which on the right-hand side image there is uh, an example of vegetative reproduction. You have a, a leader line or a runner that uh, goes out, um, plants itself uh, some distance away, and then a new uh, plant will grow from that bud, and it will continue on on that, that route. Um, typic, uh, and then um, that's prokaryotic reproduction. Uh, in eukaryotic reproduction, uh, you have um, two different types, basically, uh, mitosis and meiosis. And mitosis, uh, you have replication of chromosomes, so that's basically just um, you have a combination of the egg and the sperm, um, but you don't get any, um, what is it called now? Uh, sorry, give me a second. Uh, crossing over of the genes. So in meiosis, you have identical uh, daughter cells, but or that's mitosis, I should say. Meiosis is where you have a recombination that's what I was looking for, recombination of the um, chromosomes so that you end up with four different types of daughter cells in the end. <clears throat> and in eukaryotic reproduction, you uh, obviously need a partner. So uh, humans, we uh, do sexual reproduction, right? And in the ocean, there's uh, two two main types of reproductive strategy, strategies. Us as humans, we do brooding and care of our young. So that's typically what you'll see in marine mammals. So, so that sea otter right there is taking care of its pup right there. Uh, super adorable. I want an otter as a pet. Um, that would be kind of cool actually. And uh, But a lot of invertebrates uh, animals without a uh, backbone, they tend to do uh, broadcast spawning. And this is essentially just releasing the gametes into the water column. So a lot of times like this coral uh, in the image here, uh, a coral can't go and reproduce with its neighbor. So it has to release both eggs and sperm into the water column and hope that it interacts with its neighbor's egg and sperm so that it can reproduce. So it's a little bit more difficult, but they have uh, ways around that. Uh, additionally, you have uh, organisms who uh, do very special things. So we have hermaphrodites, and we also have organisms that change their gender depending on circumstances. So hermaphrodites uh, are organisms that contain both male and female reproductive organs, but at any given time, they may only use one or the other. Uh, they definitely don't use both um, at the same time. Um, uh, clownfish would be an example of hermaphrodites because they do have both uh, reproductive organs, um, but they generally will only have one sex at a time. Um, in this particular case, uh, parrotfish uh, would also be known as hermaphrodites. Uh, and as you can see here, the two images that I have, the female is on the left-hand side. She is not as colorful. She has more of a purpley, um, purpley color to her. And then the male parrotfish is on the right-hand side there. And how, uh, how this happens is uh, parrotfish is typically will have harems. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with what a harem is, a harem in this particular case uh, typically will have one male, one dominant male, and he, uh, this, har uh, this male will have a number of females around him. Um, but a harem doesn't have to have have to be dominated by a male. It can be no dominated by a female, which uh, clownfish are known for. Uh, but in this case, this parrotfish, uh, he's the dominant male, and he'll he'll have in his group a number of females that he uh, protects and keeps with him, and he can mate with um, however many of them he wants. And uh, 
and that's pretty much how it goes and he has a territory and whatnot uh, but if this male were to die or you know let's just say he got fished out of the water uh, he and he's no longer part of the group the largest female will then change her sex and become the dominant male so that's what I mean by uh, changing gender and so they have both a reproductive organs within them but only when the situation calls for it will they change the gender or use either or reproductive organs so uh, how do we come up with all of this stuff a lot of it has stemmed from the theory of evolution which Charles Darwin proposed and um, in his theory he um, he uh, came up with the idea of natural selection and this is where um, natural selection uh, is a process where the best uh, individuals within a population are able to uh, reproduce uh, more more offspring and uh, stronger offspring so these these offspring are not only viable but they can also uh, su successfully make it through life in order to reproduce on their own so for instance the human race is probably the best uh, uh, organism here on earth or the most successful organism here on earth because uh, we have been able to over time successfully reproduce and pass on our genes um, and in this process we have to be able to pass on favorable genes uh, to future generations so this means that uh, our offspring can continue to live and be successful and then also continue to successfully reproduce themselves um, and these populations have to be able to adapt to the changing environment so uh, uh, successful uh, individual or successful uh, individual uh, will be able to adapt adapt to whatever changes happen. So, like for instance, uh, we're having uh, a tropical storm. Well, actually, it's a hurricane right now, right? But um, uh, eventually, when it finally hits the Hawaiian Islands, it's going to be a tropical storm. So uh, we have to be able to adapt to that uh, weather condition. And so, uh, typically, uh, only successful organisms will be able to adapt to that. So, in the image there, you can see uh, uh, Darwin's finches that he used uh, in order to come up with his theory. And you can see the uh, differences in the beak shape. And so, these finches uh, all live on different islands within the Galapagos Islands. And... Uh, each finch has a different type of food resource that it uh, takes advantage of. And because of the beak shape, it allows it to take advantage of a food source that the other finches cannot take advantage of. So for instance, that finch in the top left-hand corner there has a very large beak. And because of that large beak, it can get into uh, a food resource that is surrounded by a very hard shell. Uh, whereas the one on the bottom right hand corner with the smaller beak um, will not be able to get into that same resource so it has to figure out uh, a different food to eat so in that particular case it may be eating insects or maybe it might be eating small seeds or, or whatnot that don't have a hard shell around them and so because of these finches that's where he came up with his theory of evolution so uh, classification of life this all stemmed from the biological species concept and this is essentially um, the idea that all living organisms have the classification and are classified by species type so all humans we are all in the same species right all um, cats all cats have their their own species so they can all be classified together you would not classify a cat with a human is basically what this is saying and all species within that group should be able to success successfully breed with each other and produce viable offspring when I say viable I mean that 
um, that offspring can reproduce on their own and create uh, create more offspring. So it can continue uh, the uh, the gene pool basically. Uh, when you have two populations that can no longer interbreed with each other, or um, that's when you get a species that has been reproductively isolated. So in this case right here, I have an example of a horse on the left-hand side and a donkey on the right-hand side. And when you mate the two, um, they can mate, uh, but what is produced is a meal, which is pictured uh, in the middle there. And that meal, while um, it is a living organism, uh, it cannot reproduce. So you can't put two meals together and produce a, another a baby meal that, that doesn't work. Um, and it definitely can't mate with a horse or the donkey to produce another type of organism. It's, it's infertile. So let's take a look at this next slide here. Uh, here we have um, our biological nomenclature. So how how do we um, classify each organism? So this is the route basically that we take and everything is separated into three different domains and then it gets further classified into kingdoms. So we have five different kingdoms and then we have phylums. Uh, there's a ton of different phylums, uh, class, order, family, genus, and species. And so in this case, uh, typically uh, uh, organisms that are in the similar genus should be able to reproduce with each other. Uh, if organisms are within the same family, uh, I don't think, um, I think in certain circumstances they will be able to uh, reproduce with each other, but in some cases probably not. At that point you might be uh, too, too uh, reproductively isolated. So uh, yeah, let's, let's look at this now. Uh, the study of these classifications is known as phylogeny, and that is when you have two groups that uh, share similar, uh, a, a common ancestor, basically a common point in which, um, in which, uh, sorry, that car that just drove by was really distracting right now. Um, so. Uh, all organisms share a common ancestor, uh, but at which point um, uh, you are similar to your the next organism will depend on uh, what sort of classification you are. So each uh, members of a group with common characteristics uh, are within a taxon. So um, all all uh, Organisms with a backbone are within uh, a category known as chordata, so that would be a, uh, a taxon. So uh, you and uh, me and my cat here, who is a little bit uh, frustrated at me right now because I won't let her go outside, um, we are part of the same taxon because uh, we have a very similar characteristics amongst us. So uh, here is an example of uh, the typical uh, character um, family tree, I should say. Um, but this one only shows the domains and some uh, different uh, taxon groups that you'll see within each of them. You can see all three of them uh, come from a common ancestor. So the three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Now all the mammals, um, or just all animals in general, are within the eukarya, eukarya uh, domain. Uh, the archaea and bacteria are uh, all uh, bacteria, are, are prokaryotic prokaryotes, I should say, uh, but archaea is um, particular because uh, these bacteria tend to be known as extremophiles. And so 
uh, they typically will um, be found in very extreme environments such as uh, hydrothermal vents or geysers uh, or even in outer space. Uh, they tend to live in some pretty extreme environments. Uh, and so, as you can see, though, near the common ancestor, we have viruses and bacteriophages. Um, and those are not within our family tree. Uh, and we will talk a little bit more about that in the next chapter. Um, but our textbook here does not classify them as living organisms, although they are organisms. All right, so on this next slide here, you can see um, a different version of our family tree. And in the middle of this round diagram here is where the common ancestor would um, reside. Uh, and uh, all, all along the edges there are uh, the different uh, organisms that we have here on Earth. This is a more modern representation of our family tree. Um, and if you can see in the top left hand corner there where it says animals, just below that, uh, there's it just in like really tiny print, it says you are here. Uh, and that's referring to uh, Homo sapiens. And so we are just a speck on this uh, family tree, but you can see all the different nodes and uh, it's are broken up into plants, animals, fungi, and protists, and then you have your bacteria down there as well too. So just as an example, uh, let's pick a marine example, for, for instance, the bottlenose dolphin. Um, and this bottlenose dolphin would be in the Eukarya domain. Uh, it would be in the Animalia kingdom. So we share the same uh, kingdom with dolphins. The phylum would be chordata, so we are also in the phylum chordata because we both have backbones. Um, the class would be mammalia, which we also share because we're both mammals. Uh, the order uh, for ball and nose dolphin will be cetacea, uh, and in, this is where we uh, break off and we're different uh, from the bottlenose dolphin. And then the family would be I'm terrible with uh, these names, by the way, so uh, I'm not even going to try it. Um, but basically referring to a dolphin uh, and then the genus and species. And so when you write out species, you also put in the genus. Uh, so And it's also always uh, italicized. And the genus is always capitalized and the species is lowercase for the first letter. Uh, just FYI. Uh, so, so that's it. So when it, you, when you get down to species, uh, that is very specific. Um, and no two organisms have the same, um, species name unless they are of the same species. If, uh, say you look at the, uh, genus species of a, a spinner dolphin, which is very similar, uh, they have, uh, they would have a different, uh, species name. Uh, so uh, they would not be the same species. They would probably be the same genus. Um, actually, maybe not. They might be a different genus, but they would definitely be within the same family. Uh, so you can see it gets a little complicated there. Uh, anyways, so uh, this was chapter four. Uh, next, chapter five, we will talk about um, the microbial world. So everything that is microscopic.